Uh, Results is a managed IT service provider, and we focus on IT services solutions uh, for small to mid-sized organizations who need managed or co-managed IT support to help their organization stay focused on their core business and customers and leave the uh, IT driving to us, so to speak. So please feel free to reach out uh, and find out more about our organization at www.resultstechnology.com. So uh, part of our stewardship uh, of our client relationship and for organizations we like to bring on board as clients is to help chart the path forward when it comes to technology. Uh, I know that everyone here is inundated with unending IT and cloud acronyms and and, and options and uh, the term cloud is used for what seems like everything. So we wanna try and help simplify all things cloud or at least start that today. So for today, and I'll defer to JP here, Let's just think of cloud as simply meaning a compute resource that sits somewhere else that someone else owns and you rent time on it. Let's try to keep it simple. So if we look, interesting uh, analogy, the the past 17 months with COVID taught us that with very little notice, organizations were able to work with a distributed workforce, a remote workforce. Now, some overtime was required, right? Larger internet pipes may have to been provisioned. Uh, expenditures for client VPN software, uh, maybe even laptops had to be acquired. But in the end, uh, American business figured it out and figured it out pretty quickly. So confirming that, what, technology-wise, we were in better shape than maybe we thought for remote access and work. And I think that's key for today's conversation. So if we turn the equation around a little and extrapolate from this example, if your workforce can work remotely, then why can't your data center resources, servers, storage, backups, compute in a remote or cloud environment? Interesting article in yesterday's Wall Street Journal talked about the industries and their ability to work remotely. So I'll draw a parallel here in a minute. Uh, The financial services, the IT services and professional services were over 70% able to work remotely. Conversely, agriculture, forestry, fishing, leisure and hospitality and construction were less than 12% able to work remotely. Makes a lot of sense, right? Those are hands-on, got to touch it, got to be there to to work. So applications have to be looked at a little bit in the same way to see if they're suited to run remotely or locally. And so we have to look at fit and function criteria to make sure that what is designed into a cloud solution is what's right for you. Uh, From a facilities perspective, most of you do not have purpose-built IT facilities housing your on-site servers, your compute assets. It's simply a luxury you can't afford or ownership didn't want to make that investment. Very understandable. Cloud providers like Green Cloud are providing enterprise, state-of-the-art, nationwide facilities, complete with physical security, round-the-clock staff, multiple utility power feeds, battery backup, diesel backup, and multiple tier one gig, multi-gig internet connections. So in short, they're providing the Fortune 500 level of technology to the unfortunate 50,000. And so uh, I think as we look forward, at least everything that I'm reading as for now, the future appears to be that of a hybrid IT world that'll have a combination of on-prem and cloud-based infrastructure. So today, JP Philipson, who's Senior Vice President of Green Cloud, is joining us today as our presenter, our thought leader, our cloud guru. He brings uh, 25 years of industry experience to our webinar today. And so, JP, welcome to today's cloud webinar. And with that, uh, I will turn it over to you. But quick first, by the way, there will be a few giveaways at the end. So everyone, please make sure and stick around. JP? Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. That's a a perfect uh, segue into today into today's conversation, and uh, and and just as Mike stated, you know, COVID. If we weren't already pivoting towards working in a remote world, COVID kind of pushed us there, right, wrong, or indifferent, fast or furious. It happened. Um, so the, the the whole context of today's conversation is if we aren't already there, and or we're looking to go into this hybrid style of cloud, how do we get there? That's the big question at hand. Secondly, I I guess there's probably a handful on the webinar today that are probably asking who is Green Cloud, and Mike did a great job of articulating where we are, but we are a cloud provider. Uh, We do not do everything cloud, and I think that's very key and very important because as you you begin to migrate workloads to a cloud, you want to make sure that you're you're just not going to a generalist of many, 
but you're going to those who you have confidence in. So we do five core, very specific things in the off-premise cloud world. And the reason why potentially many of you who have, have not heard of us as household end user names is for the simple fact that we do not market directly. Uh, we market directly to our managed services partners. So friends like Results Technology uh, help distribute our product set. And that, and that product set is, is simple. It's off-premise compute, it's servers, it's backup, it's disaster recovery, things that can help you grow both vertically and horizontally, depending on what your business needs are, depending on the environment that you're in as well. So to Mike's point, cloud computing for the good of this conversation is exactly what he said. It's off-premise data center needs. And we have designed those data center needs to, that you all could consume in one of many different geodiverse data centers in the US. Um, but for the good of the conversation, cloud computing is not new. Cloud is just a, it's a marketing term. It's a five letter marketing term that I believe has been overly used and overly simplified, even though it is complicated in terms of consuming it, accessing it, and more importantly, how do you, how do you manage to it, if you will? So it's off premise compute, we know that. How do we get there? It, it, it is what it is. But when I say that it's been around for years and years and years, the adoption of cloud in today's world as we know it is really at an all time high. And there's plenty of reasons and we'll get into why those reasons are and then more importantly, why you should probably think through some things along your journey prior to just jumping head first into it. So for those of you who have remote offices, for example, where maybe infrastructure resides at one office, so your servers that everybody relies off of are in one office, and maybe you have a couple remote offices that work and rely off of that office, in theory, that's a cloud. So case in point, this has been around for a long period of time. Now the cloud is accessible and financially affordable for the SMB based market, regardless of whether you have one office or whether you have multiple offices. So the reasons and a lot of the, um, a lot, I guess a lot of the adoption at the end of the day, if you, if you can think of is what is on, on the bottom right of, of the page here, marketing, marketing is driving a lot of that. But at the end of it, there's a lot of mindset that is out there today that wasn't out here years ago. So the mindset for that adoption curve is at an all-time high. Whether that's a younger buyer is driving a lot of decisions, maybe the finance department is driving a lot of decisions in terms of holding on to capital for a longer period of time and wanting to, and wanting to operationalize how they spend money. But along with that, a lot of the benefits are, are dragging behind that, such as the efficiencies along with adoption. And what I mean by that is if you can think through that example of which I threw out there, we had a, a, a multi-site office at where all of the remote offices were re relying on that one office to have and house all of their server infrastructure where all of the line of business applications reside. The question becomes what happens is, what happens if the internet goes out at that site? Well, now all of my remote sites would be relying on accessing those resources there at the main site. So the efficiencies to be gained by moving off your, your workloads to a cloud provider are awesome because you take out the internet maybe at one site. Now, regardless whether that site has internet issues, each of your remote at sites could potentially still get to that uh, cloud provider. Or that main site may be able to, you know, tether to cell phones, whether that's iPhones or Androids, to get to their data. So you eliminate a lot of things and efficiencies are gained. Also, there's some, some assurances that your data should and could be always available. When I say that, when you're picking a cloud provider, and we'll get into why that's of the utmost importance. But let's talk through some of the reasons why we see as a cloud provider reasons and benefits gained why people are choosing to move their, their small to mid-sized workloads off premise. And I'll kind of give you the big three. Number one, security. Security is at the top of the stack, in my opinion. We see people moving their line of business applications, their domain controllers, anything that they run and they see fit to run their small to mid-sized business to a cloud provider for, to Mike's point earlier, the enterprise of efficiencies and security initiatives that are baked into those solutions. We lead with a security first mindset here at Green Cloud. 
But however, at, at the small business level, everybody wants all of their data to be secure, regardless whether it's on-premise or whether it's off, off-premise in a cloud environment. So security is key and it's king. Secondly, behind that, accessibility and availability, they kind of go hand in hand. Your data should be accessible 100% of the time and it should be yours 100% of the time. So let's play make believe that you, mer- you move workloads into a hosting environment and you need access to them. They should be readily available 24 hours a day, seven days a week when your employees need them. They should also be accessible. So in the event that you need to export a file, that should be available for you on demand. Lastly, scale and agility probably come to mind in, in terms of like why I see folks moving workloads off premise. There's a lot of merger and acquisition uh, in this day and age, right? It, it just is a thing of today's business world. So as businesses are moving around, they need to be a little bit more agile. So in the days of old where I may go procure my infrastructure to be housed on site, that may actually be seen as a limitation or a liability in this day's age because you are typically historically have been planning for what we think would be the next three or five years down the road. Now, obviously, cloud computing is, and I'm going to tell everybody the obvious, it's built and designed for scale. Whether that means you go up or down, that's up to you. Whether you go horizontally, that is always a thing that needs to be considered. And when I use the term horizontally, people have to scale horizontally just as they do vertically in this day and age, meaning they are migrating from one operating system to another, or maybe they absorb a new line of business application that needs a newer level of operating system. So they, they and you have to go through and migrate data from one machine to another. So just as you're moving workloads across to that newer operating system, you'll shrink workloads after you're done. So obviously all keys, benefits, but things that you should be thinking through. So as you begin the quest to consume cloud-based resources, ask yourself this as you start to go down the path, which is the right design for me, for my business, and the goals of the business? And so I'll share with you what the big three, and the big three are, you know, obviously I have to spell out on the right. You know, everybody knows Amazon, everybody knows Microsoft, everybody knows Google, or at least they know the names. And then I'll share some differences between those providers and somebody like Green Cloud Defense. And by the way, there's not a right or a wrong place because each one of those companies serve the purposes and the greater good for the cloud computing initiatives that they serve and then they procure for their end users. It really depends on the applications that you support and you need to support your business. So for example, Green Cloud, we are known as what's called a tier two hosting provider. It's not that a tier one is any better or worse than a, than a tier two. It's just we do things slightly different. We are designed to house and, and hold predictable-based billing and production-based workloads, things that you know that you want to move to a cloud, but your billing is going to stay more flat-rated, that you know that the services that you procure through results will be supported by us, and then we support results, if you will. So our SLAs and supports 100% included. Amazon Web Services is a great example of a hosting provider that is designed for obviously to house good software applications. We see those in a lot of, lot of enterprise grade businesses. So if you're a Fortune 500 company, for example, you may have a marketing department that relies on software driven initiatives to where your, your scale needs to go up and down by the minute, even by the hour sometimes. And so with that, your billing fluctuates. So it's hard to really plan for those type of things. Microsoft uh, and, and, and AWS both, they, they sometimes can be referred to an elastic or a metered billing type model. It's not necessarily wrong or right, it just is what it is. So if you plan for that, that's one of the things to be thinking through. Also, some of the support initiatives that are delivered by some of the larger firms are included and some of them are not included. So as you're going down the path of defining what success looks like for you as you, as you find a hosting provider, make sure that everybody is digging through the SLAs that are, are provided, but also the support initiatives that are also supported, if you will. Once again, 
like I said, both of which serve the greater good for, for any enterprise. However, pick the one that's best for you. I encourage each and every one of you as you start to go down the path to work with results to figure out which is the right cloud model for yourselves. And it's an ever-changing world too. So it's a fluid conversation. So just because someone, and I, and I hear this quite a bit, just because someone says, well, I talked to so-and-so a year ago, doesn't necessarily mean that that is the same cloud model in which they, 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 they currently manage you today. Things change in an ever-changing world, just as risks change, if you will. So the risks that we used to manage to from a year ago, three years ago, are not the same ones that we're going to be faced with three years from now, let alone three months from now. So keep that in mind. So here's some of the main considerations that we see when you're aligning yourself with a cloud provider. And you can even look at this as you look at software applications or software providers as well. Think, you, think through the security initiatives of what drives compliance for your business. What's the pricing and billing going to look like? Not only as you see it on a proposal, what does it look like as you receive the bill? We're going to talk through each one of these. So I'm not going to dumb it down here. Support, what's included, what's not included, and then scale. Can you scale or are you locked in for any window of time? So security, as I mentioned, that's like at the top of the stack. That's where we see people coming in. But they're, you know, and for all the quote unquote enterprise grade reasons, what I will say is this, Green Cloud, much like a lot of cloud providers, we have to lead with a security-minded focus first so we don't show up on the front page news. You cannot look, you can't turn the TV on, you can't look through any papers, you can't go through the Wall Street Journal with seeing that a company was hit with ransomware. So the reasons why a lot of companies are moving their workloads to the cloud is to protect and to obviously defend against the, the greater threats that are out there, because I think that we all would agree that are on this webinar, everybody is a risk target today. Cloud providers like myself, we have to go through certain levels of certification. So I guess I have to go through Cisco certifications, I have to go through SOC certifications, but then we also go through PCI health checks, we go through HIPAA health checks, ISO health checks, and then we also are measured against our peers within the, within the cloud world to make sure that, yes, we are holding, we are saying that we're doing what we're doing, but we're held accountable. So there's a lot of regulatory governance that are in the space. And so if you are a compliant driven organization, by moving some workloads to a cloud provider, make sure that you are going down the right path with one that can support your compliance driven needs. Pricing and billing. Make sure that if you're looking for, for a predictable based billing model that the cloud provider has no quote unquote hidden fees or you understand what all the fee structures are in advance of going into the engagement. Make sure that you understand that if it is a metered or an elastic or a more of a utility based option that you plan for that, that you plan for some of those what I will call the peaks and valleys or the roller coaster ride that could come along with it. So uh, as things level out with some providers, make sure that you understand all of the ins and outs. Question yourselves, does it cost me anything extra if I were to export a file? Or is it a quote unquote free engagement? Make sure that you understand what that looks like and also understand fundamentally just like a, like a cell phone bill. If I make any ads moves changes to it during a month, is any ounce or portion of it prorated? And do I need to think through that in the event of those ads moves and changes? And by the way, obviously, if you're going to go down the cloud-based model to house your, produ your, your production-based workloads, as moves and changes will come, how they come, you need, to dive, you need to dig into. For example, I was just on a call right before this one, and, and a client needed to grow from consuming you know, 100 megabits of bandwidth on my data center side up to 500 gigs. So the ease of that conversation, you need to ask yourselves, can I have that in a reactive or a proactive manner with my provider or the person that supports my cloud? Other support services. Think through not only what integration you are going to have or what access you're going to have, but what access results would have to support your business. Think about your networking needs. And there are so many networking needs that are changing and evolving you know, I can think at the carrier level, from the days of old, a couple decades ago, there was something called Frame Relay. Frame Relay went to MPLS. Now MPLS is 
SD-WAN technology. Make sure that you can take advantage of some of those advanced networking functionalities that can be brought into a cloud provider. And ask yourselves and the firm that you're working with, like results, are they supported? And do you support them? And can you help with that? Migration initiatives. Migration is the, the one, it is the largest conversation that I'm a part of on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is how do I get from where I'm at on my physical premise over to the hosting environment? So for example, we work with results technology to help you identify what a successful roadmap looks like. And how do we get you from on-premise to a cloud hosting environment with minimizing any downtime whatsoever? Migration services are critical and key, both of which is a collaborative effort on, on results' behalf and our behalf to assist you with that. Pre-sales design and uh, assistance is also critical and key, so there's no gotchas or, you know, things that come up after the fact, if you will. We want, we want to make sure that everything from applications to licensing and your expectations are all in alignment. And then obviously they're scaling. I think it goes without saying, based on what I've already said today, you have to be able to scale for growth, whether that's up or down, whether that's, you, you know, all of a sudden your business has been imp impacted by something for the positive or for the negative. And then you have to figure and question yourselves, am I only gonna pay for what I, am I consuming after I scale up or down, or do I have to pay for what has been contracted and when I say that, there are, certain, there are certain providers that will charge you for what is consumed versus what a contracted amount would be. So make sure that you're, you know, as you steer through the waters, that you understand that. And I, I encourage each and every one of you to rely on results to provide you with that, with that expertise as you go down this path. As you're acquiring cloud services, um, I do encourage you to work with your team at Results. They and us will help evaluate your needs. They will educate you on all the possibilities. So for example, if, an, if I'm an on-premise firm, regardless of what industry I'm in, you need to understand all the possibilities that are out there to host potentially infrastructure needs, software applications. You may want to explore other benefits and understand the other technologies that aren't just here today, but are, that are coming. So maybe you have an interim step to get you where you need. Obviously, results ourselves will help educate you on the pricing logic and what's to come after you get into the procurement of services and then the provisioning path. And I always call it a path because it is a, you're moving from where you are today where you're going. So you need to understand what occurs during the process. Ask yourselves, do you need to be a part of it? Should you be a part of it? More importantly, make sure that you are relying on the results team. So once you're completely in the cloud, obviously, you know, you understand that the expectations and the outcomes are all in alignment. And as you're migrating to the cloud, think about this. There are multiple things that happen along the way and there are ways in which you can do that. So for example, if you are the on-premise uh, client, you can migrate to a cloud using what we call, quote unquote, our professional services migration uh, strategies, which we support results technology in supplying a litany of different software tools to move you from on-premise over to a cloud provider or one cloud provider to another cloud provider. You can also procure new resources. So if your infrastructure is at the end of life and you know that you have to either buy new gear or you can move to a cloud, understand what is needed if you were to build new, meaning if you were to have to purchase new operating systems and you had to build new data up to that cloud provider, there's a methodical step-by-step -step process that also can ensure downtime while, you continue, while you're continuing to run your day-to-day -day business. And some of the keys to success, and I'll share with you this, is obviously you need to understand your network. If, if you are over infrastructure and you have somebody that is over the internet network, it is a critical conversation for both of you to have. So just because you wanna go cloud, make sure that you understand what's being brought to your office or offices to help support and make sure that the bandwidth is adequate. Possibly look at the roadmap and the contracts at the telco level to make sure that 
what is in alignment with that person, whoever's making those decisions, that, that, that's in alignment with you. Understand the health of your servers. And a lot of times when I'm working with uh, a lot of users in the community, I always get the question, they, then they say, well, what do you mean by the health of a server? And, 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 and some folks will refer to the server or the health at the source side. And in plain English, what I'm referring to is understand that, that the operating system is in good health, meaning that you are not spiking on your CPU or maybe memory constraints. You're not constrained there. Maybe you're running on an older operating system. Understand what the support initiatives are needed to support those operating systems as you move into a cloud provider. And obviously, you're going to want to understand what your application's needs are, what they rely on. And as you move into a cloud provider, you need to also understand and ask yourselves, will that application still be supported if I move that into a hosted environment? Obviously, we help you know, rely on results to help you with, that, with those initiatives. And at the bottom of the screen, when you say, when I say, you know, obviously continue to strive for improvement, what I'm referring to there is obviously look at your hosting provider and always ask the questions as in terms of, you know, have proactive conversations with results, the hosting provider, that in the event that we are going to go tackle on a new application or we, we want to, you know, bring in a new company, how do we continuously improve, obviously, as we bring more people in that may be accessing those environments? So a lot to think about. There potentially is questions there, and by the way, if in the event that you have any Q questions, you know, that we can provide answers for, I'm going to turn that over to results.